This episode of The Unapologetic Geek is brought to you by Patreon. Specifically, my Patreon. Now look, any ad revenue I get from this channel is at the mercy of a fickle YouTube algorithm and copyright bots that don't respect the meaning of fair use. Therefore, I use Patreon to give me a more steady stream of support, and in return, I've been working behind the scenes to put out more bonus content, including an audio recording of my short story, Somatoform Purgatory, that I've been working on this week. With all that in mind, I would like to offer a special thanks to my $8 patrons, the Androids. Batty Bat Firebrand, Chuck Poor, John Burrell, Mike O'Connor, Numinous 2019, Scott Johnner, Spotes, and Warren Davis. Also, thank you to the rest of my patrons, too. I'm not joking when I say none of this would be possible without you. There were some well-remembered children's movies from the 1970s, but the vast majority of them are forgettable at best, only beloved today by those who grew up with them. Oh, hang on a tick, what is that? That is definitely not a children's movie, Google. Anyway, as the decade came to an end, studios both in the US and the UK put more focus on space opera adventures in the wake of Star Wars, and it wouldn't be until the smashing success of Steven Spielberg's E.T that kids' movies became as popular and profitable as they had been in the 50s. However, before E.T., there was one other kid-oriented science fiction fantasy that proved audiences were hungry for such entertainment, and it would come from a most unlikely source. What do you do when a horse bursts through your wardrobe at night and your parents refuse to believe you? For young Kevin, he is about to discover that there are gaping holes between fantasy and reality, through which he meets the Time Bandits, a band of outlaws intent on robbing history of its treasures, if only they can escape the grasp of the supreme being that hunts them through time and space. Kevin joins them on their adventures, meeting some of his favorite heroes of legend, before they are ensnared not by the Supreme Being, but by Evil Incarnate, who needs their map to escape his prison at the edge of oblivion. Can they defeat evil? And what's more, will Kevin's parents ever wonder where he's gone? After Monty Python's Flying Circus came to an end, the one American of the group, the animator Terry Gilliam, who directed 1977's Jabberwocky and co-directed Monty Python and the Holy Grail, found himself itching to return to the director's chair. While serving as art director on Monty Python's Life of Brian in 1978, Gilliam approached Python manager Dennis O'Brien, who had set up handmade films with ex-Beatle George Harrison in order to finance Life of Brian, with an idea for a wild, dystopian film called Brazil. O'Brien didn't like the idea, so Gilliam came up with something a little easier to sell. A kid's film, but one that doesn't fall into the standard, quote, mawkish sentimental crap, unquote. With a plot centered on adventures across time, O'Brien and Harrison both believed in the idea so much that, when other studios refused to offer any financial backing, they mortgaged their office building to executive produce it. And with that, the ball was rolling on Time Bandits. Gilliam came up with the general outline of the story and explained it to fellow Monty Python alum and star of Jabberwocky, Michael Palin. Palin, who had a degree in history, agreed to help write the script, working on details involving character and setting. For the time periods explored in the tale, Palin chose not to focus on historical accuracy, but rather the mythologies surrounding historical figures, to give the narrative a child's understanding of them. Together, Palin and Gilliam crafted a script that, in Gilliam's own words, was, quote, intelligent enough for children and exciting enough for adults, unquote. Many of the characters were written with specific actors in mind, such as Ian Holm, an actor Gilliam was eager to work with following Alien. <laughs> Holm 
Stone had previously played Napoleon in 1974's Napoleon in Love, and would play him again in 2001's The Emperor's New Clothes. Gilliam found his performance so funny, the director reportedly had to leave the set during the filming of this scene so as not to interrupt proceedings with his own raucous laughter. Though they didn't actually expect to get him, the role of Agamemnon was written with Sean Connery in mind, as the script cheekily called for, quote, Sean Connery or an actor of equal but cheaper stature, unquote. Luckily, Connery was a big fan of Monty Python, and agreed to a significant pay cut, albeit with the provisions that he get paid directly in order to stick it to his agent, and that he get a small percentage of the profits. He came up with the idea of Agamemnon using magic, and also suggested he play the firefighter in the end, as he would be unable to appear in the climax, as the script had initially demanded. As for Robin Hood, he was written for Palin, but John Cleese was coaxed into joining the cast, at which point Palin handed the role over to him and took a different part. Cleese modeled his performance after the Duke of Kent, greeting footballers at the opening of the FA Cup Final, while Palin's character, the recurring Vincent, was joined by Shelley Duvall's Pansy. This was Duvall's first role after her traumatic experience on the set of The Shining, but it wasn't as easygoing as she had hoped. During a rehearsal for the carriage scene, Gilliam himself attempted to demonstrate how the characters were going to fall safely between the actress and Michael Palin, but the director's body got caught on part of her elaborate headdress and gave her a significant neck injury that would cause her chronic pain she still deals with today. The esteemed Ralph Richardson plays the supreme being, while his counterpart, Evil, is played by David Warner. The role of Evil had been written with Jonathan Price in mind, but he was in desperate need of money and signed on to a more lucrative contract on Loophole. Of course, Price would get the lead in Gilliam's Brazil a few years later. Mrs. Ogre is played by Catherine Helmond, who the studio didn't want because they felt she was a mere television star, and Gilliam only managed to get her after the studio's choice, Ruth Gordon, broke her leg shortly before filming was set to begin. Mr. Ogre, Winston, is played by Peter Vaughn, and the game show host is played by Professor Slughorn. The main cast, however, starts with the lead role, a child, and Gilliam cast Craig Warnock, after Warnock's brother came in for an audition. Gilliam knew at the outset that he wanted the film to be from a child's point of view, and so he planned to film everything from low angles. The problem with this was that the child would literally be overshadowed by the adult characters, not to mention how risky it is to rely solely on a child actor, and so Gilliam, in a stroke of genius, decided to cast dwarves as the titular Time Bandits. Of the six main ones, there is a seventh, Horseflesh, seen briefly with evil, but he was written out of the script supposedly to avoid comparisons to the Seven Dwarves of Snow White, they are played by a virtual who's who of British little people actors of the day, including David Rappaport, Malcolm Dixon, Mike Edmonds, Jack Purvis, Tiny Ross, and of course R2-D2 himself, Kenny Baker. In fact, four of them, all but Tiny Ross and David Rappaport, appear in Return of the Jedi. While much of Time Bandits was filmed on sound stages at Lee International Studios in Wembley Park, there was plenty of location shooting done at Raglan Castle in Wales, Epping Forest between London and Essex, the beach at Dungeness, and at Ait Ben Hadou in southern Morocco. The sets were designed to exaggerate the child's perspective, with oversized props and environments, stools and boxes for regular-sized actors to stand on, and a style philosophy based on classical fairy tale illustrations melded with modern technology and a recurring motif of plastic coverings. The Titanic scenes were done entirely on sets, with the actual sinking shown through colored footage taken directly from A Time to Remember. Waiter. More champagne. Yes, sir. And plenty of ice. The ending, in which Kevin's parents are vaporized, was a source of much contention between Gilliam and producer Dennis O'Brien. During test screenings, it turned out that kids actually loved the downbeat ending, and Gilliam was vindicated, even though it would continue to be a sore spot with distributors. Another source of conflict was the music. 
Harrison had wanted to include several songs in the soundtrack that he himself would write, but Gilliam felt the music he submitted was too silly and upbeat, and insisted on a more traditional-ish score by Michael Moran. He did agree to let Harrison contribute the song that plays over the credits, Dream Away, which if you really pay attention to the lyrics, is actually a commentary on Terry Gilliam being too stubborn. According to legend, Harrison angrily told Gilliam that he was acting too much like John Lennon, which Gilliam took as a compliment. When Time Bandits was complete, handmade films could distribute it themselves in the UK, but they knew they'd need a North American release to secure a profit over the roughly $5 million budget. They screened the movie for all the major American distributors, all of whom rejected it. The relatively smaller Avco Embassy agreed to do it for an undisclosed fee, though, also requiring an additional $5.5 million to cover the costs that included marketing. Time Bandits released in July of 1981 in the UK, where it honestly wasn't much of a hit, and in early November in the US, where it ultimately grossed about $48 million, making it Avco Embassy's best performer of all time, when you adjust the numbers for inflation. It also garnered critical success, with many critics praising its style and ambition, and only a handful giving it poor marks for not being a Monty Python picture. This was especially a problem in Britain, where it was poorly marketed to appear as though it were a Monty Python picture. Despite its undeniable success, the film was overshadowed by the following year's E.T., and it is now little more than a half-forgotten cult classic, seen more as a harbinger for the 80s kids' movie boom than the actual start of it. Gilliam did toy around with the possibility of a sequel in the mid-90s, with all the surviving cast members returning, even getting to the pre-production stage with a full script written, but he abandoned the project following the death of Jack Purvis. However, a new streaming series based on the property has already finished production on its first season, and is set to be released on Apple TV Plus in the very near future. Before I get to my thoughts on the movie itself, let's get one thing straight. Time Bandits is a fantasy movie. But since this is my channel and because speculative fiction classic sounds terrible, I say any movie that has time travel in it can automatically be called sci-fi. If you have a problem with that, I'll tell you what you can do. You can hit those like and subscribe buttons and leave a comment telling me how silly I am. I make that disclaimer mainly because the thing I love about Time Bandits, and most works by Terry Gilliam for that matter, is its refusal to adhere to rational rules and historical accuracy. That works especially well for this movie, given the ambiguous nature of the fairy tale story and the fact that it's designed to portray a child's understanding of the world. There is a strong and coherent theme underneath it all, a rejection of materialism and early 80s consumerism, combined with a commentary on how, in the modern world, adults have a bad tendency to undervalue imagination and wonder, to lose the sense of magic that defines everything when we're younger. Gilliam would of course expand these ideas with Brazil, but that's a topic for another video, and honestly, I think they work a little better in Time Bandits. The movie also has something to say on the idea of perfection, of how we all have an ideal for how the world should work that forgets that flaws are not only inevitable, but maybe, just maybe, part of the design. Randall explains that their job was to patch up holes left behind by a botched creation of the universe, but they decided to exploit those holes for material gain. However, in the end, God himself tells them that they were always supposed to steal the time map in order to take evil for a test run. It's all wrapped up in absurdist humor and homages to great fantasy writers like J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and L. Frank Baum, but there is a kernel of something profound in there that can stow away with the goofiness and plant itself in the heads of children of all ages. It might just be Terry Gilliam's greatest film, albeit with some very stiff competition, but regardless of where it stands, Time Bandits is absolutely a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite kids' movie? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, 
Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching, and until next time, when we'll see virtual reality flowers for Algernon, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. You've got two edge yards of coconut and you're banging them together! You've got, you've got, you've got two edge yards, you've got two edge yards, you've got two edge yards of coconut and you're banging them together! Drugs! Hey!